A German study has found more than 40% of people infected with COVID don't even know. The rate is even higher among elderly people. And long COVID? Symptoms of the chronic form of the virus may also go unidentified. That could include organ damage. Testing could be more important than ever. Welcome to the show, I'm Ben Fazulan. First up, let's talk to the author of that report to discuss the consequences of not knowing you've got COVID. Philip Wild was the principal investigator in the Gutenberg COVID-19 study. How do you determine that over 40% of Germans don't realize they have COVID? Yes, good afternoon. Actually, we have drawn a population-based sample from the local registry offices, and we asked uh, study participants uh, whether they had a former proven infection at two time points, uh, four months apart from uh, each other. We asked uh, uh, these participants uh, we uh, to provide a PCR test, which we did in them, and importantly, we measured antibodies. And these antibodies are able to indicate whether you had a former infection independently, whether you were vaccinated or not. And you've looked at over 10,000 participants over half a year. Uh, is that something that you could mirror elsewhere in the world? Well, I would take a note of caution there. Um, the frequency of unknown infections depends very much on the rate of testing. And in Germany, we have across Germany quite comparable uh, regulations. So there, I think we can uh, translate these to other regions. However, with translating that to other countries, we have to account for the frequency of testing, which um, um, uh, um, has an impact on the number of um, uninfected um, infections. No, no matter the number, though, what, what are the consequences of not knowing that you've got COVID? Well, actually, uh, as you showed, we learned that, uh, um, interestingly, in the elderly especially, there are more unknown infections uh, at about two-thirds of the people 60, uh, 75 and plus, whereas in uh, those 25 to 30, for example, it's only a third. Uh, what this means, it relativizes a little bit uh, the um, incidences, although, of course, uh, all the severe cases and uh, diseased persons may not, should not be forgotten. And uh, it will help us to recalculate uh, the risk for persons and at cer in certain conditions. Not only the risk for people who actually have it, but what about the people around them as well? Well, exactly. So what uh, the problem is, the, the spreading um, um, can be very well assessed if you uh, do the testing. And, and, and what we learn is that what we currently do is still not uh, enough to recognize all infections. And if you want to have an early warning system and recognize a new virus variant, um, for example, then we need a good testing strategy uh, to um, um, detect and unravel all those, uh, these unknown infections. So, Philip, is it time to get self-tests out there to make sure that everyone is not only working out whether or not they're infectious, but whether or not they've had the COVID virus? Yes. So, um, uh, certainly, I think uh, currently it is uh, a good idea to test better, especially in the time where we are driving back uh, preventive measures. We are having major public events again, like the... Uh, um, the soccer championship right now. Uh, in these cases, we need to have this early warning system and still also vaccinated people should get a testing because they still can transmit uh, um, an infection to um, not vaccinated uh, individuals. And uh, the other thing is regarding whether you had COVID, there we learned that we still have to see what are the right antibodies to measure because the majority of people did not have all antibodies positive, but a certain one. And we have to learn in which persons you have to measure which antibody before we can go for a screening for long COVID. And how many of these unknown cases could actually be long COVID? Yeah, that's a matter of debate. We are currently still investigating this in our study, and that takes a little bit of time because the definition of long COVID means six months after the acute infection. 
And um, what we currently know is only for the known cases that at about 10% are thought to develop long COVID. And again, 10% of these 10, uh, which is one of all known infections, develop a severe long COVID uh, syndrome. And what we have to investigate and learn now, how many people of the asymptomatic inf infections um, can get these sequelae. And could there be a concern for younger people that they could have COVID, they may not know, and their organs may be uh, damaged, uh, which, which may come out years later? Indeed, uh, that's what we fear, and, and that's what we want to learn about. Is there a molecular signature, something that you can measure in the blood, which indicates that you are on the way of developing a long COVID syndrome, not yet having symptoms, but that in the future you could develop a symptomatic disease which limits you on your life quality or also in the length of your life. Um, but this is still a matter of research. Everything we are doing there is still speculative, and we have to gather more data to be sure about um, how to tackle these, how to identify that. But what we have to fear is, yes, that it is possible, even in asymptomatic infections um, or mild infections, that a few people are at risk of developing um, a long COVID. Okay, the Gutenberg COVID-19 studies. Philip Wirt, great to have you on the show today. Thank you. Well, long COVID sufferers are calling on health care providers, employers and politicians to take their predicament seriously. For many, work is out of the question. Day-to-day -day activities are also a major challenge. Johanna Seibach has named her oxygen device Erwin, written with AIR. The 25-year-old suffers from long COVID and was born with a heart defect. Months after her initial COVID-19 infection, she needs oxygen therapy, even when only doing small chores like vacuum cleaning. Without the device, she often has difficulties breathing. The most worrying moment was one time when I was taking a shower. The steam made the air even thinner. I started crying because I couldn't breathe anymore. I more or less fell out of the shower. I was trying to breathe, but nothing was coming in. According to initial studies, about 10% of COVID-19 patients have similar symptoms. Johanna used Facebook to get in contact with some of them. They often suffer from constant exhaustion and lack of concentration months after their initial infection. In Johanna's case, the symptoms are so severe that the 25-year-old expects never to be able to work as a tax assistant again. I suspect it will come down to a disability pension, whether full or partial, I don't know yet. I would still like to work, but right now I'm not able to. I'm happy if I manage to get out of bed for four to six hours, depending on the day, but mostly I lie in bed and vegetate. Hello. Johanna Saalbach also suffers mentally from her illness. She talks to a psychologist every week. He has already helped several long COVID patients. We now have a new group of chronically ill people in our society. That will have an impact on all kinds of levels. It will be noticeable on the labor market. It's crucial that these people are not left behind in terms of their participation and also financially. Johanna Salba hopes that her application for a disability pension will soon be approved and that she will be met with more understanding when it comes to long COVID. My biggest wish is that people start taking it seriously, that they don't dismiss it and say, she's just being silly, she just has to get out of bed and get a grip. And my second wish is that politicians and researchers also take it seriously and that further research is supported. In a few weeks, she should know whether she will receive a disability pension. That would resolve one of many uncertainties that long COVID has brought to her life. Now your turn to ask the questions. Here's our science guy, Derek Williams. Do other viruses also cause a pulse syndrome like long COVID? 
Over the last year and a half, we've learned a lot about the chronic condition that affects up to 30% of people infected with COVID-19 uh, for weeks or, or months after they supposedly recovered. But there's a whole lot more that we still don't know about what's causing the wide range of long COVID symptoms, which often include crippling fatigue and, and what sufferers call a brain fog. Although some common symptoms of long COVID are, are pretty specific to an infection with SARS-CoV-2, uh, for example, a, a loss of the sense of smell, uh, researchers and doctors say there's also quite a bit of overlap with many chronic symptoms that can sometimes be triggered by other pathogens, uh, among them viruses that cause the flu, uh, mononucleosis, and, and herpes. Many of the long-term symptoms reported by long COVID sufferers are also common in people diagnosed with what's known as myalgic encephalomyelitis or, or chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, when its origins can be traced back to a viral infection, the condition is often called a post-viral fatigue syndrome. Because its symptoms are so wide-ranging and physiological reasons for those symptoms so difficult to pin down, uh, many people who suffer from post-viral fatigue say they've often been told by doctors um, that it's basically all in their heads. Uh, but with millions of people worldwide now reporting long COVID symptoms, the good news is that governments are beginning to throw quite a few resources at basic research in the field of post-viral fatigue. And, and that basic research will very likely have positive knock-on benefits for people who suffer from similar conditions that have been linked to other pathogens.